Hello everybody, today um, we have a new lecture on advanced structure analysis, AE4520, and I am uh, your instructor, Mustafa Abdullah, speaking here. Um, the subject of today's lecture, and it is in the series on basics, is uh, stresses and strains, and these are our learning objectives. Uh, the first learning objective is to understand the definition of stress and strain and then understand the relation between strain and displacement. And we will concentrate in this lecture uh, on the case of one-dimensional structures, which are bars, which can only um, extend or contract. So, as to that, we are going to work on understanding the possibility of different definitions of strain because this is something that sometimes causes some confusion. And finally, we are going to uh, try to understand the effect of rigid rotation on strain definition. And this is uh, a fairly important thing to keep in mind. And then, of course, at the end, I'm going to summarize um, the lecture. Yeah? Okay, so we move on to the definition of stresses and strains. And in order to define stress and strain, people started from the simplest uh, structural experiment, which is simply a uniform bar under heat inside force, F. And under such a force, you can easily imagine that the bar is going to extend and then the amount of extension is uh, u. And we'll see that u is actually what we call the displacement, but at one point, which is the tip of the bar. So how do we define stress and, and, and strain? First of all, let us imagine this type of experiment what would be the physical variables that we can record during the experiment? These would be the amount of force and the amount of extension. So in principle, we should be able to end up with a simple curve where we can plot the force versus but this curve will not only depend on the type of material from which the bar was created. It will also depend on the geometry of the bar. So if you increase the cross-sectional area of the bar, it's easy to think that it will be more difficult to cause the same amount of extension. The same thing is the bar is longer, then for the same cross-section and same force, it will extend much more because a very long bar can be thought of as a bunch of shorter bars and the amount of extension for the shorter bars add on together to form the extension of the whole bar. So in order to get rid of the geometric effects, so that we end up with actual material properties, or at least values which are plausible to be thought of as material properties, we need to use other values which are not extension and force. And these are we put force to unit area on the vertical axis and displacement per unit length where L is the initial length of the bar on the horizontal axis. In that case, we can believe that such a curve would actually be independent of A and L. It no longer depends on the cross-sectional area A of the bar, this one here. or the length of the bar.
And this now is defined to be our screen. And this here is defined to be our stress. And as such now, the relationship between stress and strain no longer depends on the geometry of the bar, but depends only on the material from which the bar is made. So these are the definitions we're going to go with, that stress is force per unit area, and strain is displacement or extension per unit length, or we can think about it as change in length divided by the original length. So these are the definitions we are going to work with. The next thing we need to investigate is what happens if we have a bar which is also inclined. So it's no longer moving along a single line, but the tip can move in any direction. The bar remains straight, but after deformation, it is no longer aligned with um, its direction before deformation. So we start with a generally inclined bar, and instead of working just with the length, we work with the length components along two perpendicular axes. So we have a distance x and a distance y along a horizontal and vertical axis. And from geometry, we can write that the original length squared is nothing but x squared plus y squared. That's uh, quite straightforward. The displacement also, or of the tip of the bar, we can think about it also in terms of components. So we have a horizontal component U and a vertical component V. In order to calculate now the strain of this bar, what we need to do is to calculate the length of the beam after deformation. And in order to do that, we can simply assume two axis systems here. So this is our x, and this is our y. And write the position vector of the tip of the beam before deformation, which would be x and y. And the position of the tip of the beam after deformation. And that would be x plus u and y plus p. Then, from the position, because essentially the position after deformation is simply position before deformation plus the displacement. So now, this gives us the position of the tip of the beam with respect to the origin here, which is the other side of the beam. So the length squared of the beam after deformation is nothing other than x plus u squared plus y plus v squared. And from there, we can easily calculate our strain because our strain would be L minus L naught over L naught. So what we see from here is that all of a sudden, the relationship between displacements and strains became much more complicated once we take the ability of a beam to rotate into account. And this comes from all these square roots we need to take in order to calculate the new length of the beam. So essentially, strain now is no longer a linear function of the tip displacements u and v. Moreover, 
if you expand L squared, you can write this as x squared plus y squared, which would be the original length squared, no problems, plus 2xu plus 2yv plus u squared plus v squared. Let me add this very quickly. So what this means is that the new length doesn't depend only on the magnitude of the tip displacement. It also depends in its direction. So how much strain you get doesn't only depend on how much the tip was displaced, it will also depend on the direction of the displacement because of these terms that we have here. So actually, this reminds us that the displacement is a vector. It is not really a scalar. It's not just the magnitude of displacement that makes a difference, but also its direction also is important. And since we're going to take a square root, we see easily that strain, as I said, is not a linear function of, of this basin. Okay, so now let us go to the next step and look at the relationship between strain and displacement. So by definition, strain was simply the displacement u over the original length L0. Were you or the displacement of the tip of the bar? This works when the bar is uniform so that we need only to worry about the displacement of the tip. But in general, the bar might not be uniform in the sense that maybe it has a variable area. So maybe it's a thicker bar, for example, and it has larger area at the base from the tip. In which case, your stress will not be uniform because area is changing. And assuming that you have a unique relationship between stress and strain, then this means that your strain also will not be uniform over the length of the bar. In that case, we need to find a way of calculating strain that doesn't work over the whole length of the bar, but works for an infinitesimal part of the bar. So what we do is we take the small part of the bar of length delta x, assuming x is along the bar, and apply the definition to that small portion. So this point here, we think about it as point at, at, at the distance x from origin, and this point here will be at the distance x plus delta x. So let us look at the position of the start point, point one here, on the bar before deformation, it is at a distance x. After deformation, it will be at a distance x plus the displacement of that point, which is u of x. Then, we do the same for this point here, which is point two. It starts at x plus delta x and ends up being at the same position plus the displacement at that point, which is u, at x plus delta x. Very good. So now, what's our original length? We subtract these two guys, and we obtain that the initial length is simply delta x. Then we calculate the final length, which is we can subtract these two. x disappears, so we end up with delta x plus u of x plus 
delta x minus u x. And this we can simply write as delta x times 1 plus u of x plus delta x minus u of x over delta x. And since we consider very small portion of the beam, we can think about this as the derivative of u with respect to x. So we can write L as delta x 1 plus du by dx, where now u is a function of x. And it just tells us the displacement at the point which was originally at distance x from the support. And then, from here, we can easily compute our strain, which is change in length of our original length to be du by dx. So strain, actually, is related to the rate of change of displacement. Not rate of change in time, but rate of change in space. Um, in multiple dimensions, we would call that the gradient. All right. So we move on to the next thing, which is what happens for the inclined bar? And what type of relationship we might get for that? For the inclined bar, if you remember, we started with this, with a bar in this position, it has a length x in the horizontal direction, length y in the vertical direction. And we will define a coordinate starting from this point here, which is the beginning of the bar, and the distance along the bar, we are going to call it S. Because it is not aligned with either axis, it's not aligned with X or Y. So in order to identify a point on the bar, we are going to call this distance S. All right, so now, let us take a small portion of the bar, and again, this point we call it 1, this point we call it 2, and let us see what the position of point 1 and 2 before and after deformation, and from there we can calculate our strain. To simplify things a little bit, we are going to name the inclination angle of the bar theta. So let us now calculate the position of point 1. The position of point 1 is going to be S cosine theta along X and S sine theta along y. And if the length of that piece of the bar is delta S, so the position of point 2 is going to be S plus delta S cosine theta and S plus delta S sine theta. After deformation, we add the displacements. So, for point one, it will be S cosine theta plus U at S. And S sine theta plus V of S, where U and V are the components of displacements along the horizontal and vertical axes respectively. For point two, we add 
the displacement at S plus delta S. So we end up with S plus delta S cosine theta plus U S plus delta S and S plus delta S sine theta plus V of S plus delta S. Okay, so now let us look at the vector connecting 1 and 2, which is the position of point 2 with respect to point 1. So that vector, let us call it R12, before deformation will be nothing other than the subtraction of this vector, position vector minus this position vector. And this will look like delta S times cosine theta, comma, sine theta. So that's very simple. Now, after deformation, we just subtract the position vectors of 1 and 2 after deformation. So we can write R1, 2 after deformation to be equal to. If we subtract, we are going to get delta S and then we'll be left with cosine theta plus du by ds and sine theta plus db by ds. It's very simple. So now if we look at the magnitude of R12, it would be simply delta s because sine squared plus sine squared equals 1. But if we look at the magnitude of R12 prime, we'll see that it will be delta S and then big square root of cosine theta plus U prime squared plus sine theta plus P prime squared. Yeah, where primes are derivatives with respect to S, which is the length along the bar. And from there, we can easily find that our strain is nothing other than square root cosine theta plus U prime squared plus sine theta plus V prime squared minus 1. And this already shows us how we can calculate strains of inclined bars. And again, we see that the relationship between strain and displacement is not very really simple anymore. It is not a linear relationship anymore. Of course, in the case where the displacement of the beam is purely along its own direction, so in that case, your U will be some delta, which is the total displacement at a given point, times cosine theta. And of course, delta is a function of S. In the general case, if the bar is not uniform, of course, and V will be equal to delta sine theta. And it shouldn't be difficult for you to show that in that case, epsilon would be nothing other than delta prime. And then we recover the same thing as we had before for um, straight bars so that where, where the displacement is along the bar direction. So the nonlinearity in the relationship between 
the displacements and the strains come because of the possibility of rotation. So it's actually rigid rotation. If it is pure rigid rotation, so if the bar simply rotates, then there will be zero strain. But if you have a combination of strain and rotation, then you will see that you end up with a nonlinear relationship between strains and and displacements. Okay. So another point that's worth discussing here is is there a single definition of what we call strain? And the answer to that might be, yeah, you have just defined strain to be the change in length of our original length. But this is not necessarily the only possible strain definition. And I'm going to motivate this by thinking again about our tension test experiment. So think about it as we are increasing F very slowly, very slowly, quasi statically through time. So after a while, at a certain value of F, let us say after applying 100 kilograms to kilogram force to, to the bar, we can measure a certain length of the beam. Then, after that, we can continue from there. So the question is, if I am at 110 kilogram forces, should I refer my strains to the original length of the bar or to the length it had when I had the 100 kilogram force applied. And both can be done. So if you think about it this way, you, you will see that you can end up with an incremental definition of strain. So you can say that change in strain equals change in displacement, which is change in length, over the current length of the beam, which is the original length plus the uh, displacement. And taking the limit where we make these calculations incrementally at a very small increment, then we can write this as d epsilon by d u equals 1 over L naught plus u. If we integrate we can write epsilon equals natural logarithm of L naught plus U plus a constant. Since we already know that at no displacement, strain should be zero, so we can write that zero equals natural logarithm of initial length plus C. So this already teaches us the value of C. And we can end up writing epsilon to be the natural logarithm of L naught plus U minus the natural logarithm of L naught. And from the properties of natural logarithm, we can write this as 1 plus U over L naught. And from here, we this type of strain, some people call it true strain, it has other names, but doesn't matter. It is not the same strain as the first definition we used, so we're going to give it a, another name. So I'm just going to add a small t as a subscript here to consider this true strain. Of course, it's not really any truer than the engineering strain that we have been using. It's just a matter of name convention. So. This is equal to the natural log logarithm of 1 plus epsilon, where epsilon is regular, let's say, or conventional engineering state.
Yeah? So what this does is it tells us that we can map from one strain definition to another. So if I know the engineering strain, I can calculate the true strain and vice versa. So there is no, there isn't really much need to be too specific or too tied emotionally to a particular definition of strain. But there is a, a big difference in terms of how we interpret experiment. In the sense that when we do an experiment, we can record a curve which gives us a relationship between engineering strain and stress. Or what we can do equivalently is to have a curve that gives us the relationship between some other strain, maybe this one, the logarithmic version, and the stress. These two curves will not be the same. So when you are calculating, you will need to use different equations to describe the material behavior. But both types of strains will be describing exactly the same experiment. So there is no need to be too specific about strain definitions because we can always work with one or another without any loss of um, physical reality. Both things will be describing the same experiment at the end. I'm saying this because in many cases there are certain forms of strain which are more advantageous from a mathematical point of view. And then it's good to learn that using them is not an approximation really. It is just a different way of describing the same experiment. So what is business with green strain? And why do we like it? If you remember our discussion of the inclined bar, you will see that our biggest problem that caused the square roots and complications was that um, we needed to use a square root in order to find the new length of the beam. And that's what introduced nonlinearity into that strain displacement definition. So if we define our strain a little bit differently, we might be able to simplify the type of nonlinearity we get. And this was pretty much the idea of Gree. So he defined his strain to be like this. It's a change in the square of the length divided by two times the square of the original length. So instead of working with changes in length, it works with changes in the square of length. And the reason of that factor of two is not very complicated because we can write this as L minus L naught times L plus L naught and then we will end up over L naught here, over L naught here, and there is a 2. L minus L naught over L naught is just engineering strain, so you end up with one half then engineering strain. L plus L naught is, can be written as L minus L naught plus two times L naught. And then when we divide this by L naught, we end up with two plus epsilon. So when you simplify, you will find that green strain is equal to regular strain, regular conventional engineering strain plus one-half engineering strain squared. Okay, so that's quite quite simple. So again, we end up with a relationship between both strains. If I know green strain, at least if, if strains are sufficiently small, I can always find 
engineering strain. If I know engineering strain, I can always calculate green strain. Another thing that we might notice is if we go back to the logarithmic strain we had, it looked like this. If you expand it with the Taylor series, this will give us epsilon plus epsilon squared plus epsilon cubed plus and so forth and so on. So both green strain and logarithmic strain, both of them are equal to engineering strain whenever the strain is sufficiently small that higher order terms can be neglected. So the difference cannot be seen except when strains are, are really large. And again, as I said, it doesn't really matter as long as the stress strain relationship you use is based on the correct definition of strain that you're using for describing the structure. Okay. So now if we go back to the inclined bar, we can find that green strain has a simpler form compared to um, compared to engineering strain, because for that case, we can write green strain to be one half cosine theta plus u prime squared plus sine theta plus p prime squared minus one. This is actually quite simple. And the reason why it is simpler than the other one is that the other one contains the square root. If you expand the square root, even assuming that u prime and v prime are small, you will end up with quadratic terms, cubic terms, and more and more to infinity. But green strain is always quadratic, so it always terminates. It doesn't have cubic terms and so forth and so on. It has only linear terms and quadratic terms. So it's actually much simpler to deal with it mathematically compared to engineering strain. If we expand this, we can write green strain in the following form. Cosine squared plus sine squared is one, minus one cancels. The linear terms will give us cosine theta u prime plus sine theta b prime, and then the quadratic terms are going to be u prime squared plus v prime squared. And this is an exact expression for green screen in the case of an inclined bar. If we assume our displacements to be really small, then we can neglect the quadratic terms with respect to the linear terms, in which case we already know from here that green strain is equal roughly to our engineering strain. So to first approximation, we can write our engineering strain to be approximately equal to sine theta u prime plus sine theta p prime. And this is now an approximate linear relationship. So in general, in the presence of finite rotations of the bar, the relationship between strain and displacement is nonlinear. And if we use green strain, it will be at least quadratic. But if we assume that the displacement are, the displacements are small, such that the gradients of the displacements are small, so u prime and v prime are both much smaller than unity, then we can approximate our strains with 
linear strange space information. And in that case, there isn't really much distinction between engineering strain or green strain or logarithmic strain or any other type of, of strain. This leads us to a summary of our discussion. So we have defined stress to be for the unit area. We are going to have a separate lecture on stresses and how they are defined later uh, in more detail. Most of the discussion was on strain, so we divided it to we defined it to be change in length divided by original length, and then we have shown that it comes out to be a function of the derivative of the displacement or rate of change of displacement with respect to space coordinates, not with respect to time. Then we found that strain displacement relations are linear in the case of a straight bar which, uh, which is extended along its own direction. In, in this case, there is no rotation, rigid rotation involved. We have also seen that this is not the case if it starts to rotate. Then we have seen that there can be multiple strain definitions, and it's just a matter of mathematical convenience if we use one or the other. Then we define a special type of strain we call green strain, which is almost quadratic in displacement, so it's the least nonlinear form of strain we can find. And then we have shown that if we neglect these quadratic terms in green strain, we can get approximate linear strain displacement relations. And these approximate linear relations are what we usually use in structures uh, to get linear relationship between displacement and strains so that the overall pro problem becomes linear and we are able to use the principle of superposition. So in future lectures, we are going to discuss strains in 2 and 3D, and we are going to also discuss stresses in 2 and 3D and learn more uh, about them. Again, in the series lectures on basics, then we'll see how to get these things applied to plates and beams uh, in the rest of the course. Thank you very much.